here at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. And this afternoon, we are so excited to have uh, Dr. Megan McCoy from the Department of Social Work at NAU, who will be presenting about um, her research and aspects of it, as well as the community partnerships and the work that um, also is very integral to that work that she does. Um, so the title of this afternoon's talk is going to be Transforming Silence into Action. Building Alliances for LGBTQ2S plus Older Adults in Arizona. And I just also want to um, focus your attention at the very bottom. Uh, we have a text there that signals to you that this event will be recorded and the recording will be available on the Fairness First campaign YouTube channel. And all attendees are automatically muted upon entry. So before we get into the talk, I do just want to introduce a little bit more about what is this talk series about, what is the Fairness First X Talks, um, and then further in just a bit, I'll be introducing what is SHRC and what is SHARE, and who are these folks who are putting on the talk. So um, first, the Fairness First X Talk is a space for researchers who are advancing health equity or health fairness through their research and the community partnerships that they form around their research. Um, it, it is for them, it's a space for them to connect with others at NAU as well as um, our broader regional and um, global community. Um, so Fairness First Talks, Fairness First X Talks are virtual conversations with health equity researchers and advocates um, that pinpoint how research can support the well-being and advance the well-being of Southwest communities here in uh, the United States. So if you see those little um, words at the very bottom of the slide, it's a uh, space one for connection, for connecting with others around this shared interest area. Two, it's a space for collective learning. So though we're gonna hear from Dr. McCoy in just a bit, uh, we do reserve some time for a Q&A session. So we're hoping that we'll facilitate that co-learning and that co-sharing. So that collective learning opportunity will be um, a part of our time here this afternoon. And then last of all, it's a place for curiosity. So what that means broadly is just keeping an open mind about information that's shared. Um, folks will also share their collective understandings, their experiential knowledge, um, things that they encounter throughout their lives and how they connect to the topic at hand. So uh, just keep an open mind about everything that will be shared here this afternoon. So very briefly, uh, we at the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative, or SHRC, as I had stated before, we are a part of the NAU Center for Health Equity Research, or SHARE, um, at NAU, or at Northern Arizona University. And on the right-hand side, there's a, a picture of where we are located. So that's the Applied Research and Development Building on campus. And to the left is a photo, a rather outdated photo, but uh, a photo nonetheless of a lot of the folks who um, contribute to the work that we do at SHRC. And so we do support a lot of the researchers who um, either wanna connect with community, we uh, provide technical assistance uh, to help them strategize on ways that they can better maybe improve the ways that they're connecting with community, but also um, connect them with communities so that they're also getting input on ways that will help to um, increase the sustainability, if you if you might say that, um, or the strengths of their dissemination um, strategies or the ways that they're sharing their research findings back with, the, with their communities and continuing and building on those conversations around areas of health concern and community health concern. So as I begin to wrap up my time here with the introduction, I do want to engage you in these um, broader Zoom community agreements. So these are just some um, encouragement for how to, um, 
I guess really enhance our connection here this afternoon while we're with Dr. McCoy. So we, because it's a, you know, it's a Zoom meeting, sometimes we do understand that folks have a lot of things going at the same time, prefer to have their camera off, but if possible, please keep your camera on because it, we feel like it does help to strengthen that community engagement that we have with each other this afternoon. Second, um, we do encourage please stay muted during the talk unless you're prompted to share. We're going to have some questions that Dr. McCoy is going to pose, so that would be the moment that you can unmute. And then, of course, we'll have a Q&A session um, right after Dr. McCoy's talk, so that will be the time when you would also unmute. And then lastly, um, please stay engaged in the conversation, and we highly uh, encourage you all to participate during the Q&A. So, uh, you know, ask your questions then, share um, how you're connecting with the topic and things of that nature. So without further ado, I do want to welcome uh, Dr. McCoy again, and she will be pulling up her slides in just a bit. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let you go, Megan. All right. First, can everybody hear me? <laughs> Most importantly, yes. awesome. Um, first, I want to, and actually, let me minimize this so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, great. Um, there we go. Um, first, before I begin, I just want to thank um, everybody at SHRP, Carmen Lita, Alex, Caroline, for uh, coordinating this talk today and all of your tech support. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to welcome everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about transforming silence into action building alliances for LGBTQ two-spirit plus older adults in Arizona. Um, and I'm gonna start with uh, the, the pictures that you see on this screen, which actually aren't from Arizona at all. They're actually from um, a pride uh, parade in Portland, Oregon back in 2019. Um, and I share this because this was uh, coincided with the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots. And if you know anything about LGBTQ plus history, you know that the Stonewall riots are, riot is regarded as um, sort of the catalyst for the LGBTQ civil rights movement. Um, and what was significant about this particular uh, Pride cel celebration um, is that um, an LGBTQ aging service provider in Portland um, was the grand marshal for the Pride Parade that year. So the parade was led by older adults, including older adults who had been at Stonewall. Um, and there also were a number of aging service providers, um, allies from senior centers who also marched with them. So in terms of this conversation today, which is really about building alliances, um, I think this is just an example of how that can be done um, and a way to really start this talk. Um, so again, welcome, bienvenidos, yate. Um, if you say hello or welcome in a language that you don't see there, feel free to drop it in the chat. We all learn that way. Um, if everyone could just take a minute just to introduce yourself in the chat, um, share your name, uh, what pronouns you use, uh, where you're joining us from today. Um, I really would love for this talk to also be an opportunity for folks to connect with one another who may have shared interests or things in common um, beyond this talk. And I will, it's a little hard for me to see the chat and talk, but I see folks chiming in. Um, and as you're doing that, I really wanna thank everybody for being here today. Um, I want to make sure from the outset that I acknowledge uh, my community partners in the Azalea Project, which I'll be talking about a bit later, uh, Tina Alonzo, David Reagan, all the amazing uh, staff and community members at the Beatitudes campus. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, my uh, colleagues at NAU um, and beyond who have joined today. Um, and I also understand we have some students on today as well from NAU, um, social work students, and I, I want to I mention those as well. Um, and finally, I also want to mention all of our collaborators on the Azalea Project. And there are, as you'll learn, there are far too many to name. So thank you all for being here today. And I see a lot of folks chiming in down there. Awesome. All right. So with that. So today I'm really tasked with sort of telling the story of how I came to be involved with LGBTQ to Spirit Plus health equity related research. Um, so I'm going to share, and this is not people who know me know that I don't really like to talk about myself, but I'm going to share a little bit about where I'm from and some of my background um, to help you understand how I got to where I am today. And it was definitely not a linear path. Um, I come from a town called Glenside, where I grew up, um, which is 
you can kind of see this little black dot down here. That's Philadelphia and Glenside is literally right on the edge of Philadelphia. Um, I spent much of my life in the city of Philadelphia working, uh, living. I went to college at Temple University. Um, and I, in, in sharing where I'm from, I also want to acknowledge that I am from um, the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape people. Um, and I do that because where I come from, um, land acknowledgement is not something that I ever really heard growing up or in my professional life <laughs> on the East Coast. It wasn't something I learned about until I lived in other places like Oregon, like Arizona. And for me, as I've um, come to be giving presentations where I'm introducing myself and where I'm from, um, I feel that it's important to acknowledge um, the land that I feel most connected to, whether it's the, the streets of Philly that I <laughs> walk down every day to work, whether it's uh, the beaches at the Jersey Shore where I went every summer as a kid, um, I feel that it's important that I acknowledge the history of that land. And so I do that today. Um, to the right, you see a picture um, that is me in the middle there uh, with my parents. Um, I grew up, um, in, in, as I said, in a suburb of Philadelphia. Um, I grew up in a two-parent household. Um, I grew up with the privilege um, of growing up in a household where both my parents were educated at the college level and beyond. My father was actually um, a college professor, a film professor. Uh, my mother uh, also had a master's degree. Um, so I grew up with the privilege of education um, in addition to, to privilege in terms of my racial identity and, and growing up in a middle-class um, household. Um, one thing from my childhood that I think that really most relates to this talk is that um, both of my parents instilled um, a sense of social consciousness and social justice in me. Um, both were involved in the civil rights movement um, in anti uh, Vietnam War efforts. And um, I, I can't really pinpoint one exact thing in my childhood, but it was sort of a constant thread of looking at the world in a socially um, critical manner, being aware of what my privilege was and being aware of the responsibility to, if you see something, say something and to speak up um, when you are witness to injustice. So that is something that I grew up with that I think very much informs the work I do today, um, even though I may not have recognized it, you know, when I was six years old. Um, down below, you see a picture of an older woman. That is actually my grandmother. That's my father's mother. Um, she lived to be 99. Um, that is her playing Pinochle at age 95. Um, and I also grew up in a family where aging and, and older adults were valued um, and their storytelling and wisdom was valued. Uh, my grandmother had seven kids, um, with the exception of one who died uh, right after World War II, and my father, who only lived to be 74, um, her five other children lived well into their 80s um, and into their 90s. So I so I sort of grew up in a family that had some longevity, and I grew up around older people. Um, I, you know, a lot of kids go to preschool. I didn't go to preschool. I I went to my uh, aunt to stay with my aunts and my grandmother, and I I heard a lot of stories that way as I was growing up. And then finally, this picture to the right is um, myself and my wife. I I identify as a cisgender woman, as a lesbian. Uh, this is us in front of the Stonewall Inn um, in New York City. So I, I share this um, because there are three things here that I think really inform the work that I do. First, the critical social consciousness that I was raised with. Second, um, the uh, value placed on, on aging and older adults in my family, and then my own identities, uh, identity as a member of the LGBTQ community. And so, eventually the personal and the professional intersected. <laughs> um, and if you had asked that kid up there to the right, um, you know, would you be doing LGBTQ two spirit plus aging health equity research? She would have had no idea what you were what you were talking about or what those words meant. Probably at that age. Um, what I can tell you is that I grew up at a time where we didn't have the expansive language for sexual orientations and gender identities that we have today. I grew up at a time when terms, just the term gay or the term queer, definitely had negative connotations. Um, I grew up at a time where if you acted in a way that people thought was inconsistent with your gender, um, you certainly heard about it. And that was definitely the case from, for me. I mean, I grew up very much um, identified as a girl, but was uh, definitely um, not a girl who conformed to what society said girls should do. And I share that picture because I played baseball when I was a kid and I was uh, the only girl in the league. Um, and so I think, again, my own identity um, eventually led me, I think, to a path of social work, uh, though I didn't start out that way. My undergraduate degree is actually in English. Um, but shortly after I graduated, uh, I thought I was going to go to law school, possibly. Um, but I sort of fell into a um, social work position. Um, and the rest, as they say, is sort of history. 
Um, and I can't really talk about um, how the professional intersects with the personal without talking about a place called Center in the Park. And those of you who have met me since I've been at NAU have probably heard me talk about Center in the Park. You might even be tired of me talking about Center in the Park, um, but it's a really um, important place in my uh, professional and personal journey really for that matter. Um, so I, I have to speak about it today because I like to say everything I learned, I learned at Center in the Park, everything I learned about social work, Everything I learned about engaging in community-based research, I learned at Center in the Park. Um, Center in the Park is a nationally accredited senior center in Philadelphia. It's been around uh, since 1968. <laughs> um, and it has a mission that centers the voices of its participants. Um, and that the fact that I, from an early point in my career, um, worked in an organization where the voices of the community were valued um, has really shaped the way, first, that I approached social work, but also that I now approach research. Um, second lesson I learned at Center in the Park was taking a strengths-based approach to aging in later life. And I think I already kind of had that from what I experienced within my family, um, but uh, certainly um, the work that I did in a social work context there also influenced that. I learned about equitable academic community research collaboration. Center in the Park was involved in a number of academic community research projects on which I was fortunate to be able to be a team member. And I learned what true collaboration looks like. I learned what it looked like to do research with communities rather than doing research in communities or to communities at, at the extreme, um, to, to the other extreme. I also learned about allyship, um, both at the individual and institutional level. Um, I work, you know, as a white woman, I worked in a community that was primarily Black and African American, and I learned how to be an ally to those communities. Um, I also learned what it meant for an institution or an organization to be an ally, um, both to the people it works with, but also to other organizations. I remember. So I'm going to share a scenario in a minute. Um, one of the really first times that I really thought about the intersection of aging with LGBTQ two-spirit plus identities um, was when I was working as a service coordinator in a senior apartment building that Center in the Park operated. And we had a resident um, who had a medical emergency that I happened to sort of be the first person there involved. Um, and while when I arrived and while we were waiting for um, 911 to arrive, you know, it became clear to me that the resident um, presented themselves outwardly um, as a gender that was not necessarily consistent with what the paramedics were going to see when they arrived. And it really made me realize how critical it is that we have training for people across all, le all levels of service in terms of how to engage with, L with LGBTQ older adults, particularly um, when they are their most vulnerable, which, which this person was. And so, and that's an extreme example, but I'm gonna walk you all through a scenario um, and ask you, um, to imagine that, and you can uh, put your feedback in, in the chat here for this. Imagine that you're an older adult and you are um, having lunch at your local senior center and you're sitting at your table and you see a new participant come into the senior center sitting by themselves. How do you think you would respond to that? And feel free to just type in the chat how you would respond. And you could even think of it in terms of if, if, if imagining yourself as an older adult is a stretch, which it's not for, for a lot of us on this call. Um, you could even imagine yourself, you know, at, at lunch on campus at NAU or in your dorm. How would you go sit with them? Thanks, Kyra. Katie, you'd experience a range of emotions before deciding how to proceed. Ask them to come sit with me. Introduce myself and ask about them. Try to give support. These are all terrific responses. Oh, let's see what else we have offer to sit with them or if they wanted to sit with me, great. So most of these, and, and feel free to keep chiming in if you'd like, most of these responses, you would most likely engage with that person on some level as a peer, right? You might introduce yourself or say hello, you might invite them over, maybe you'll go plop yourself right down and sit with them. So based on my experiences, you know, working at Center in the Park and working in various social services programs, um, I began thinking about the dynamics involved with creative, creating welcoming environments in places like senior centers. And there's a lot of dynamics involved with that. There's policies, there's what happens in practice, and there's also the dynamics that happen between peers. And that's sort of why I went through this little scenario. So most of us immediately said we would engage that person. Now I'm going to ask you, 
to continue with that scenario and imagine yourself that you decided to go over and get up from your table where you're sitting with your friends and talk to them. And imagine you heard someone at your table say in a negative tone, I heard they're gay. What would, how would you respond to that person? Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> And, and so what? I'd be like, okay, so, so a lot of so's, good. I would say, so what? Right, so I would ask that person if they think gay is a problem, so it's being really direct. Doesn't bother me, I have family and friends who are gay, great. Okay, thank you all for sharing. So. These scenarios that I just asked you, um, in a study that I did when I was working on my dissertation, I interviewed senior center participants, not at Center in the Park, in, in a different senior center in a different part of the country. And um, one of the things I, I asked them was how they would respond to these scenarios. And similarly to you all, um, when I asked the first part of the scenario, uh, people overwhelmingly said they would engage with the person. Um, but when I added uh, the component of somebody at their table making a negative comment, um, those responses varied. Some people would directly confront the person who made the comment, like some of you all suggested, um, and, and some in no uncertain terms. <laughs> um, others, um, others might just sort of say whatever and kind of ignore them and go do what they were going to do. Others um, said that they would maybe internally have a reaction, but they wouldn't know how to express that outwardly. And these are the kinds of things that happen in a senior center. And why this is so important is because when someone walks through that door to that senior center, hoping to access a service that they really need, like a meal, um, like a support group, like an exercise class, um, you can have all the welcoming signage you want in that building. Your staff might be absolutely trained in how to be LGBTQ culturally competent. But if you sit down at that table and somebody makes either an overtly negative or a micro aggressively negative comment, um, or if somebody just doesn't respond when somebody else makes one, that could be the difference in whether or not that LGBTQ older adult ever comes back to that senior center again, and they might really need that meal. So I became really interested in exploring the dynamics in community-based centers like senior centers um, and how we can work toward building an inclusion that is meaningful and that really disrupts the silences that are historically constructed by ageism, by homophobia, by transphobia, and also by heterosexism. Um, and I was fortunate also in my time at Center in the Park to be involved in LGBTQ um, inclusion efforts there. I was involved in partnering with um, wonderful LGBTQ serving organizations in Philadelphia where we, where we worked collaboratively um, to build inclusion at Center in the Park. Um, uh, <clears throat> and that's that picture that you see to the left there. And the reason that this is important is because historically, both in aging policy, um, in aging services, and also in LGBTQ communities, LGBTQ older adults have been basically um, invisible due to this the intersection of ageism, um, homophobia, transphobia, and heterosexism. On the aging side, for a long time, we didn't talk about LGBTQ, let alone two-spirit older adults. And on the LGBTQ service side, um, programs and services tend to be very youth oriented and, and, and focused. Um, and often LGBTQ two spirit plus older adults don't see themselves represented in their own communities. Um, any LGBTQ two spirit plus older adult who walks through the door of a senior center of a um, in a residential senior living setting in a, in a nursing facility um, has lived through a tremendous amount of history that we have to understand. The oldest older adults right now um, huh, were alive during World War II at a time when you could be sent to a concentration camp for being LGBT. Um, they lived through the Lavender Scare when you could be fired uh, for, for, for your sexuality. They lived through the Stonewall riots. They lived through 1973 when homosexuality was removed from the DSM and no longer classified as a mental disorder. So before that, you could be hospitalized. Um, they've lived through hate crimes and we continue to live through hate crimes. Um, 
including such as 1978 with the Harvey Milk assassination. It lived through the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s, um, or as my students like to say, uh, the AIDS epidemic of the late 20th century, which always makes me laugh. Um, they lived through Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Defense of Marriage Act. If you're my age, I'm solidly Gen X. Uh, Matthew Shepard's um, death due to a hate crime in 1998 um, really resonated because he was the exact same age I was at the time. And I share this slide, and I always share this with students when I do talks like this as well, because I think we know a lot of the history that's happened in the last 24 plus years or so um, in the 21st century. Um, and we've had a lot of positive change with things like marriage equality, but yet we still have a lot of... Um, we, we do not have equality consistently in the United States. It varies very much by where we are geographically and the climate there. And so any, any LGBTQ older adult has lived through all of this. And we don't create, when we don't create spaces that are inclusive, we're forcing that older adult to once again have to negotiate whether or not their identity is going to be ex accepted in, in the spaces that we serve them in. And this creates a lot of health equity challenges um, significant health disparities exist as a result of institutionalized homophobia, transphobia. Um, transgender elders are at significantly higher risk of violence, poor physical health, disability, depression, and perceived stress compared to cisgender peers. And LGBT older adults tend to avoid accessing health care and social services outside of LGBT specific community providers. And that's really important for us to think about, especially in more rural communities and even suburban, where we might not have LGBT specific providers. Um, I'm not going to read all these stats to you, um, but there are a number of risk factors related to social isolation, disability, mental health challenges, loneliness. Um, if you take nothing else away from this, it's really um, the risk of victimization. 82% of LGBT older adults report being victimized at least once in their lifetime. 64% have been victimized three or more times. Um, among um, American India, Indian and Alaskan Native women, 78% who identify as bisexual, lesbian, or two-spirit have experienced physical assault, and 85% have experienced sexual violence. Despite all these risk factors, there's also a tremendous amount of resilience in the community. Um, I share the picture on the left, which actually comes from the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, um, who put together um, a series of images they collected uh, during for, during a storytelling event featuring um, transgender elders. And they made these photos and images accessible um, to others in the community because there's a lack of inclusive imagery related to LGBTQ older adults, particularly of, co of color and particularly transgender older adults. So I share that image here. Um, and also to highlight, I see resilience in that picture. Um, I see um, enthusiasm and smiles and um, I think it really highlights the resilience of communities as well. We're learning that um, despite all the, the health disparities uh, that we've learned from research, we're learning also how LGBT older adults identify a welcoming environment. We're learning that they want our organizations to be welcoming and that things like asking about sexual orientation and gender identity positively influences older adults' perceptions of the degree to which an organization is welcoming. We're learning that the language that we use matters. So, oops, sorry, I jumped ahead, although I do need to speed up, I see the time. Um, and just really quickly, where we are now, we have a growing body of research focused on risk and resilience among LGBTQ plus older adults. You notice I leave the two-spirit out there and that is intentional. Um, we do not have a lot of research on two-spirit communities at this point. And um, while the body of research in general is growing, we still um, need much more research that's intersectional in, in its focus. Um, in terms of policy, we still do not have explicit language in the Older Americans Act, which is a key federal policy related to aging um, that includes LGBTQ plus older adults as a population in greatest social need. But states have the discretion to do that. And I'm, I'm actually happy to say that Arizona um, has done that in their current state plan on aging. Um, and then among service providers, we see dynamics um, of, and there's certainly been um, a movement toward uh, increased cultural competency among service providers, but we still do see service providers who have attitudes of we serve all older adults or we don't discriminate, um, which is much different than being intentionally inclusive. So that brings us to the Azalea Project, which is what I really want to talk about. Um, and the Azalea Project is made possible through a community campus uh, partnership program grant from NAU through SHRC. Um, and the purpose of this grant is really to allow researchers to spend a year working with a community partner to develop the relationships necessary to engage in meaningful community-based participatory research and research that's done with the community. 
And I'm working on the Azalea Project um, with uh, Tina Alonzo, who is my colleague at the Beatitudes Campus, which is a residential senior living community in Phoenix. Um, and Tina and I met on a panel discussion about a year and a half ago. I was presenting on LGBTQ stuff. Uh, Tina was presenting on uh, dementia care. And we realized that like we wanted to work together. And we started talking and thinking about what a project might look like um, and decided we wanted to focus on a way to build inclusion at the Beatitudes campus for LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus older adults. Um, since then, our partnership has grown to involve, I think we have about 25 or so community partners, including LGBTQ community members, um, aging services providers, uh, hospice providers, um, uh, several uh, grassroots community organizations, such as uh, Older Lesbians Organizing for Change, who have come to the table. So the list of partners is long and growing, and we're really excited about that. Um, this is a picture of the Beatitudes campus, which, as I said, is a residential senior living facility in Phoenix. And similar to a senior center and all those dynamics I shared earlier, those exist in residential uh, settings as well. And we want to um, understand how we can use research to better uh, build inclusion at the Beatitudes campus, but also create models um, that can be used in other residential uh, living settings as well. So what is the Azalea Project? It started as um, Tina and I beginning to talk about what a research project might look like. But we realized pretty quickly that we are not the only ones um, who must be concerned about this issue in Arizona. And we wanted to learn what other people were doing and what was happening around the state. So we decided to um, host an LGBTQ to Spirit Plus Aging Equity Forum. And we saw this as an opportunity for folks to share their personal or organizational experiences related to LGBTQ to Spirit Plus older adults as an invitation to engage in an ongoing LGBTQ aging stakeholder group and to invite others to join, which we're still inviting others to join, and ultimately to form an alliance that can be an ongoing stakeholder group to inform the direction of future advocacy programs and research impacting LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults in Arizona. And in Arizona, we know nationally 5 million LGBT older adults, 5 million older adults who identify as LGBT will exist nationally by 2030. Currently in Arizona, 4.5% of the adult population identifies as LGBT. Arizona ranks 19th in the US. Interestingly, Washington state is first. I would have guessed California, but it's Washington. Um, 8% of those 65 plus in Arizona identify as LGBT. 17% of those ages 50 to 64 identify as LGBT. So that's important because it means that the number of LGBT older adults in Arizona will be growing as those younger older adults uh, move into the 65 plus demographic. We also know in Arizona that um, our degree of LGBTQ equality is not great. Arizona is orange, which as you can see on the left indicates low uh, degree of LGBTQ equality. Um, this map is um, comes from the movement, the Movement Advancement Project, which is a, an organization that tracks a variety of policies, including LGBTQ policy um, across the country. Um, you will see that in terms of sexual or inclusive sexual orientation policy, um, Arizona scores a seven out of 20, which is fair. You'll see in terms of gender identity policy, we're a negative one out of 23, which means we have policies that are so bad that they have rendered a negative score. So overall, Arizona scores a six out of a possible 43.5. So the growing LGBT aging population in Arizona, coupled with um, the current state of policy in Arizona really demands that we have some kind of stake statewide stakeholder group where we can learn from one another, where we can identify ways um, to inform policy, to inform programs, to inform research. And I want to share a bit, and I know I'm going to go over time a little bit, but I think I want to share a bit about what we learned from our LGBTQ2 Spirit Aging Equity Forum that we held back in September when Tina and I organized this, we had no idea who was gonna show up, if anyone was gonna show up. <laughs> um, and we had over 35 people attend. Um, I'd say about 25 of those um, have continued to be actively engaged. So we're really excited about that. Um, and that picture is David Reagan, who um, is one of uh, my colleagues at the Beatitudes campus, who was our keynote speaker for that event. So we asked four questions at this event. We had breakout groups. And this isn't, I want to be clear, this is not research at this point. This is simply engaging with the community in dialogue um, to be able to help understand where research may be able to help support LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults in Arizona. Um, we asked, how does your community or organization support LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults? We asked what people felt were the biggest challenges or concerns. 
We asked how folks viewed Arizona as a state for LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults to live in age and place. And we asked if there was one thing that the folks wanted Arizona policymakers to know, what would that be? Um, so here is some of what we learned. Um, we, we heard from different geographic regions. We have representation um, in the Azalea Project uh, from Phoenix, from Tucson, from uh, Coconino County, from the Verde Valley. So we've, we've reached a variety of, of regions in the state from tribal communities. Um, we still would like to reach uh, further than we have, but we heard that in some places in Tucson, there's a newsletter that, that um, provides resources for LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults. In Apache Junction, we learned that there are some women only communities where everyone is supportive. Um, we learned that in tribal communities, the importance of um, understanding differences in tribal culture um, and how that varies and how, how to work with each individual and within their within their tribe and their support system individually, um, as well as the need for more support against indigenous violence. Um, from Phoenix, we learned that um, some allies would refer folks to um, LGBT serving organizations in Phoenix and, that, and that's how LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults are supported there. Um, we also learned from some of the service providers that were involved of how they've approached supporting LGBTQ2 LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus older adults, uh, starting visibility groups, um, creating comfortable and welcoming spaces, um, partnering with LGBTQ plus organizations, uh, practicing radical hospitality and healthcare. We learned how allies are supporting LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus older adults um, by uh, educating uh, their peers using social media positively, uh, this person noted. Um, coming from a place of curiosity, asking questions, how can I be inclusive? Um, thinking about the role social workers can play in helping LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus older adults to navigate um, challenging systems, whether it's legal systems or um, the processes associated with, with end of life care. Um, and I love this quote, sometimes it just takes one person, an ally to step up and then other people step up too. And that is what I believe uh, we are doing with the Azalea Project. LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus older adults concerns are include legal and end of life planning, healthcare, housing, both affordability and, and inclusivity and transportation. And most of these are things that, that you know, older adults across the board are concerned about these things. The added layer for LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults though are fear and discrimination, social isolation versus sense of belonging and the current political climate. So LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults are concerned not just with the availability and affordability of resources in later life, but whether or not these are inclusive. Uh, folks talked about what would make them feel safe, um, hearing doctors, et cetera, using inclusive language showing empathy throughout the experience, the service experience, whatever that is, um, inclusive signage and stickers, um, not assuming that someone is a Christian. Um, and with inclusive signage, you have to back it up. And that's another um, key takeaway from this forum. And so we talked about how do you build trust, right? And beginning with the local community and then growing beyond that, um, emphasizing the importance of including Two-Spirit in the acronym. And I know the acronym can be a lot of alphabet soup and a mouthful. and um, we grapple with that too, of, of, of how, you know, what to include, how to make this more <laughs> user-friendly, especially for a generation of older adults who may um, not be comfortable getting beyond the LGBT uh, letters. Um, people talked about building trust being a challenge because of the fear that exists in all queer communities and how we dismantle that. And people talked about being kind and gentle and creating safe spots to build trust. Ongoing challenges in Arizona, um, people felt if it wasn't for their isolated community, they, they don't think many folks would be living here. Um, there are certain cities, churches that aren't a good fit. LGB, this is a big one, LGBTQIA2 Spirit Plus organizations often overlook aging populations, that's ageism that we talked about earlier. Um, and um, the political climate can make it even more difficult to find resolutions. Um, we also, uh, learned about the importance of cultural considerations. Again, each understanding um, the diversity within tribal communities and that each tribe has their own rules and traditions that relate to the tribe they're a part of. Um, also that there's a lack of resources in tribal communities. Um, and also when we're asking questions about Arizona, not all tribes recognize Arizona, right? They, they recognize their tribe as a national sovereign state. So that question didn't feel as relevant. Um, and then in terms of cultural diversity, just understanding that um, not all cultures may be seen in retirement communities because some cultures take care of their own um, within their families. So 
this was another big thing, what people want policymakers to know, and I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, they want people to know about social isolation versus belonging and that isolation can be, it, it, that older adults can be isolated as it is, and it can be even worse for LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults, but that we are here and have been for a long time. Um, they also wanted to not be overlooked when big studies and plans are happening. Um, LGBTQ2 spirit plus Older adults and allies want policymakers to know that they want safe spaces. Um, education and training was also a huge uh, topic of discussion. Uh, more education for the general public related to LGBTQ communities, but also related to older adults, um, requiring cultural competency training to license individuals in their areas or specialty of work, um, and then anti-ageism training for younger generations. And people also wanted accountability systems in place to hold providers and professionals accountable um, and that organizations and policymakers should be held accountable. So the key themes, if you take nothing else away from this talk today, um, are that there are concerns about discrimination, lack of inclusion and need for safe spaces. Um, there is a need for education and training related to healthcare providers, case managers, social workers, and also younger generations, and that we need accountability um, for providers to be built into our systems. So. Where we're going next, uh, we had our forum in September. We reported back to the Azalea Project Group in November. Um, and then in February, we began um, really um, breaking into work groups, uh, particularly around education and outreach. Um, we sort of uh, view the work of the Azalea Project as encompassing uh, the four circles that you see there. Uh, it involves research, outreach, advocacy, education, and training. And we're initially focusing on the education and training and outreach uh, rungs of that because within the group that we've created, um, we have some strengths there and some potential to make some, some difference differences. Um, we are working toward a focus group that's being developed and led by the Attitudes Campus residents um, to build allyship um, in local senior centers around LGBTQ, Two-Spirit Plus communities, and I'm really excited to see sort of what direction that goes in. Um, we are working on refining the mission of the Azalea Project to sort of, we, we sort of started out with this vision and now we're really honing in on what is our mission going to be moving forward. Um, and in terms of outre outreach, we are focused on uh, working for creating an Azalea Project website that can be a centralized uh, place for aging resources for LGBTQ2 spirit older adults and service providers in Arizona. And if any of this sounds of interest to you, we would welcome you to join us. We always say there are as many seats at the table as people who want to join us. And our next meeting will be April 26th. Um, in terms of developing this alliance, it's taken a common interest. It's taken trust open communication, shared ownership of the project. I'm here sharing this project today, but it is not my project. It belongs to each and every person who has become a part of the Azalea Project. Um, it involves open-mindedness, being open continually to knowing or learning what we don't know we don't know, <laughs> um, and being open to the respective expertise within our group, and then ongoing self-reflection, both individually as community partners and as a collective. Um, and I'm going to end with a quote um, from Audre Lorde, who said, in the transformation of silence into language and action, it is vitally necessary for each of us to establish and examine their function in that transformation and to recognize their role as vital within that transformation. So in terms of breaking these silences for LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults that have, histor have historically existed, um, we all play a role in that. If you are a, a student, an MSW or a BSW student here who works with kids and you're thinking, I don't work with older adults, what does this have to do with me? You may have a kid who has a caregiver who is an older adult who identifies as LGBTQ2 spirit plus at some point. Um, we all play a role um, in this process. Um, and I really appreciate everyone being here and your time today. And I'll end with this. Um, if this work of LGBTQ2 spirit plus health aging LGBTQ, bleh, I can't, I'm with a fumbling over my words because I'm at the end. LGBTQ2 spirit plus um, aging equity is new to you. What is one thing you learned or something uh, you learned or that surprised you today? And if you're involved in similar work in other places, what advice do you have for us as a newly formed LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus stakeholder group? And I will, and feel free to drop those in the chat um, and I will end there. And I apologize for running over a bit. <laughs> oh no, you, you're, you were totally fine, Megan. That was very fascinating. And um, uh, before we jump into opening up to Q&A to the broader audience, I do just want to 
I'll let you know that we have two questions in the chat for you, Megan. One of them is, is Beatitudes Campus faith-based? And then the second hey. is what time on the 26th for, for your event? So yes, they are faith-based, um, but I would say a very inclusive faith-based. Um, and I'm not sure if Tina is on the call or not. If Tina, if you're here, if you want to jump in, feel free. Um, but they are a faith-based um, organization, um, but they are um, an organization that has inclusion built into their mission and vision. Um, and they've been um, a really incredibly welcoming and wonderful partner to work with from the top down. Um, I feel like I've become an honorary member of the Beatitudes community in working with them. Okay, and then the second question is pertaining to the event that you mentioned on the on April 26. And so the question is what time on the 26. So we actually just set that date and are finalizing the details. Um, if you are interested, I think uh, my email information will be shared and feel free to, to email me and I will get you on our mailing list and I can send you um, the exact time when uh, when that will be on the 26th. Most likely it'll be like a 10 to noon or 10 to one. That's typically what it's been in the past, but we haven't confirmed that yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. So at this point, we'll go ahead and just open up to the broader audience. If you have any thoughts, any questions, or even if you want to answer those questions that Megan just had on the screen, please feel welcome to unmute yourself. This is now time for community and just to co-share with each other. Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Go ahead. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. McCoy. My name's uh, Kate Salvino. I'm a first year doctoral student at ASU in social work. And my interest is um, is LGBTQ aging. Um, and awesome. one, thing, <laughs> one, one thing that I'm interested in, you kind of mentioned, you touched upon it, is this idea of resilience. And then, um, you know, like I, and you went over the um, history, like the kind of historical perspective of the community and what, what they've endured over time. Um, and what I'm primarily interested in is looking at like contextualized resilience as it relates to like over the life course and older adults. Um, so all these events that you mentioned, like with respect to the, the LGBTQ community or to, to us, I'm sorry, that's the first time I heard it. I'm not, I don't know how to incorporate that yet into my vocabulary, but I will work on it. <laughs> um, um, but uh, has anyone, has anyone looked at contextualized resilience with over the life course in older adults? And I would... Uh I, I'm not sure specifically, but I would look to, are you familiar with the Goldstone Institute at the University I am. of Washington? I, yeah. I, I yeah. I, well, go ahead. I would start there. I, I would start there. I haven't looked at that specifically, uh -huh. um, but I would probably start there if I was, if I was going to, to look into that and see where that leads. Um, yeah. I mean, my interest is really, um, and I wish I, I had, I usually do this presentation in a longer format. So I was trying to squeeze probably too much in. Um, I'm really most interested in how community-based spaces can mm -hmm. function as identity affirming spaces that promote resilience um, because of the socialization that exists um, in places like senior centers, like residential senior living communities, because of the programming that exists in those places, right? That provide right. all these, all, all this social capital that you, that you need in later life. And my sort of, position is that um, the burden of inclusivity should be on the organization, not on the individual, and that we should be creating spaces that promote resilience. So, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't have a definitive answer to your question, but that's where I would start looking. And I, I'll, I'll shoot you an email because there's- Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to learn more. That I, I'm actually more interested in, but I don't want to take up everyone's time. So no problem. No, I'd love to talk. Email you. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you for that question. Um, Felicia, I see your hand is up. Yes, Go. thank you. Um, I So this work that you're doing is for all of Arizona. Um, I was wondering how much uh, community partnership have you gotten from Flagstaff slash the uh, Coconino County area? 
So I know we have at least one uh, representation from at least one organization in Coconino County. Um, we are open to connecting with folks. One of the challenges that as a, as a team that we Tina and I have been grappling with is um, whether to have virtual events or in-person events. And we've sort of done a combination of both um, because we know that it can be limiting. Like the first, uh, what I didn't say was the initial forum that we had was in-person in Phoenix. So we knew that that was gonna limit who would come but we also felt like we really wanted to connect with people in person. <laughs> um, our subsequent meetings have had virtual components, which is, I think, allows for more folks to uh, participate and to continue to participate. But we would love to have more representation from Coconino County. So feel free to, I mean, we can always chat um, if you have ideas for that. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I think we have about time for maybe one one question. Okay, Felicia, I see your hand is back up. Yes, if someone <laughs> else has a question, uh, feel free. Um, I was going to ask a question about the focus group. Um, uh, th what do those meetings look like? Because um, I know you have the one on the 26th. Um, so, kinda yeah, so the initial... Um, LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus Aging Equity Forum. Um, we had a keynote speaker. Um, I did a bit of a presentation presenting some of the information I shared today around some of the history and, and context. Um, and then we had uh, three or four, or now I'm forgetting, I think there were four, there were four breakout groups um, where we posed those four questions I mentioned in each of those groups and then sort of compiled what we learned from them into what I presented today. Um, so they weren't like formal focus. This, this isn't like, we're doing IRB <laughs> um, level research at this point. It really was just hearing from the community. It was more like a, like a listening session uh, with breakout groups. Uh, the subsequent meetings included reporting back, um, but then also a discussion among all of the Azalea Project uh, participants about what direction we sort of wanted to go in next. And we agreed that work groups seemed like a good idea. Um, at our last uh, most recent meeting, which was in February, we actually had uh, one of the members of the Azalea Project um, who works for the Pima Council on Aging, which has a program uh, called Project Visibility focused on um, training folks to be inclusive of LGBTQ2 spirit plus older adults, uh, shared a presentation on their work with us so that the, the group could learn more um, about that. And then we had uh, work groups around um, outreach, education, and building a website. Um, and we had folks who engaged in that meeting, both virtually and in person, and it worked really well. So that's sort of a general idea. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Long -winded. Um, a little bit. I understood uh, from your presentation what you have done. Um, I was just kind of wondering more of uh, like going forward, what those kind of <clears throat> look like, so especially with the upcoming been... one. Yeah, so we're in the process of planning that one, um, but it will be probably similar to what we did last time. We will be sort of breaking into groups, uh, into our work groups to continue working on those topics, as well as as probably, we'll probably always include some kind of speaker, um, whether it's from within the group to share their expertise, because that was one of the impetus for this as well, is like, we know there's people around the state who are doing good work and we want to share that with one another so that we can learn you know if, if there, there's a lot of great work happening in tucson how can we maybe do something similar to that in flagstaff right um or, or wherever it is um so that's a big piece of it as well so we want to bring expertise both within the group but also from outside the group uh, to the table as well and that's something we'll be doing moving forward too and it's a, again we're a very new nation group so um it's very much uh in the process of forming what what we will be moving forward but we're really excited that we have the investment that we have. And thank you to all the Azalea Project uh, partners and collaborators who joined today as well. I really appreciate that. Okay, and with that, uh, Megan, I just want to thank you again so much for presenting and being here with us this afternoon. Um, there's just so many kudos for you in the chat regarding your Fairness First X talk. Thank you. And um, just make sure that you check those out. So to everyone, thank you so much for attending, for your engagement, for your openness to learning. Um, and also before you go, we would love for you to share your feedback with us in a, in a more formal way by um, either going to that website URL there, it'll take you to a very brief evaluation survey, or if you have your smartphone handy, you can just um, scan that QR code there down at the bottom. 
Um, and we will also follow up with an email just uh, with the link and that information as well. If you want to continue the conversation with Dr. Megan McCoy, um, here is her email address. We will also share this with you in our follow-up email to you all as participants. And then finally, if you want to learn just a bit more specifically about Dr. McCoy's community partnership with Tina Alonzo and the Be Attitudes campus, uh, they did participate in a very brief blog entry. So this was their feature from last year. Um, you can also just scan that QR code there at the bottom with your phone. Um, and we'll share, be sure to we'll be sure to share this link with you as well so you can read all all about that. But without further ado, thank you again so much for being here. And we hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so I think we, if you didn't already, you could stop the recording. I think um, I dropped off because my internet. Oh, wait. Then I can stop off. it. Okay.